I am Marcus James Dixon, Senior Editor at Gold Derby, and we are pleased to be joined today by Nicholas Bertel and Tara Stinson, the composer and two of the songwriters for the new Netflix movie, Don't Look Up. Um, Nicholas, let's start with you. You've worked with director Adam McKay on Succession, The Big Short, and Vice. Uh, can you talk to us a little about your guys' working relationship on the new movie? And also, how did you originally meet uh, all those years ago? Sure, sure. It's been amazing to collaborate with Adam. Um, he's, you know, he's one of my, he's one of my dearest friends. He's uh, certainly the funniest person I've ever met. <laughs> and I honestly, I was, a, I was a huge fan of his, uh, you know, before we ever met, um, my, my wife and I quote Anchorman to each other about 80 times a day. So, <laughs> um, but uh, I'll, I'll say we, we first met, um, I, Many, you know, many years ago, I, I feel very lucky to have um, first met Jeremy Kleiner and Didi Gardner, the producers, uh, who uh, who are the co-presidents of Plan B Entertainment. Um, I met them many, many years ago and um, first collaborated with them on 12 Years a Slave with Steve McQueen. And uh, a few years after that, um, I remember speaking with Jeremy and Didi about The Big Short. And uh, it was Jeremy who connected me uh, with Adam. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, we could say, you know, see if he's interested in listening to some of your music and you have a chat. And I remember we just had a chat and um, it was such an amazing conversation. First of all, Adam's just the loveliest person to speak with. He's brilliant. He's funny. He's uh, incredibly open. You know, he's an, a really wonderful collaborator. Uh, and that all came through on that first phone call, you know, and I remember he said to me, I hadn't been hired, you know, but he said to me, he was really curious for the big short. He wanted to know, about he was thinking of the sound of dark mathematics like what would that mm -hmm. sound like like if there was this dark mathematics that was having this nefarious effect on us you know and so i wrote a, I, I wrote a piece i was like oh let me think about that and i sent him this piece of music that i called the tessellation and he listened to it and he was basically like you're hired <laughs> he, he liked it he, and that became sort of like one of the themes for the big short this idea because it was part of that that world you know and sort of thinking about that sound of dark math um, and honestly, ever since then, it's been every project is different. Every project we do is a different type of really a different type of tonal experiment in some ways. You know, uh, people talked about the big short as being a docudramedy. Um, Vice is this incredible, this dark, dissonant, uh, but also, you know, uh, uh, comedic at times, you know, absurd approach and look at, uh, at Dick Cheney uh, and, and modern American history. And then uh, succession is this you know, fascinating kind of, you know, uh, mixture of absurdity and, and gravitas. And Don't Look Up is, I would say it's the most overtly comedic, you know, it's really, it's a breakneck comedy uh, that also happens to deal with the stakes and what is at risk here, you know, and the stakes are huge. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I think that thinking about the challenge of artistically of how do you come up, what is the sound of that? And um, on a score level, it really was a few different things. You know, it was the first thing was coming up with a sound. The first thing I did was write a piece that was about the sound of the sort of reverence for logic and knowledge and science. Uh, and it's a piece called The Overture to Logic and Knowledge that I actually wrote and that Adam played for actors on set um, in the early scenes in the film. Um, but then it was about, you know, kind of the opposite of that sound of like, well, what if we don't have that type of <laughs> reverence? And, you know, what if we don't, you know, muster the forces to, you know, solve our problems? And, and the sound of that is this sort of absurdist big band, this bombastic, over the top, every instrument in the kitchen sink kind of approach where there's a toy piano and celestas and bass saxophones and dueling trumpets and banjo and, you know, so there's, there's, I think the biggest challenge was the constant morphing from, you know, reverential orchestral music into, uh, you know, a crazy big band into, you know, I also wrote all the commercial music in the movie and all the bash themes and ringtones you hear on the phone. All, I wrote all of that music as well. So there was this big, you know, panoply of, uh, of elements there. I think dark mathematics is a great title for a horror film. I feel like you guys <laughs> that next. <laughs> Tell Adam. <laughs> um, and for people that haven't seen the movie, it, it's a it's about a comet coming to Earth and and politicians who willfully ignore it. It's kind of an allegory for climate change, for COVID nineteen, for you know you name it. And knowing that the movie was more comedic than your your you've done in the past. Do you essentially have to do two scores? You have to write a lighter score and in a more dramatic score as well? It's a great question. You know, um, there were, I would definitely say there was a multiplicity of 
sounds and, 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 and emotions that I created for the film. And it was a, it was really an experimental process. I worked so closely with Adam and also our amazing editor, Hank Corwin. Uh, you know, we'd be in the edit room together and we would try different things out. And I think, um, it's a really fascinating thing, the nuances that are possible with film music where different, you know, even the slightest gradations of tone or changing one note in a chord and something really feels very different. And um, we did a lot of experimenting, um, you know, the main title theme was a real sort of discovery for me where that was where I first put this sort of, uh, uh, you know, bombastic big band Mm -hmm. idea and I remember that show, showing that to them and having that feel like a real interesting moment a sort of discovery and then figuring out where else might that go and then what else is needed and you know um and then uh and then also uh you know working on these songs and in particular the 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 work that went into just look up I will just say was you know uh we worked on that I mean from start to finish it was about over a year of work went into mm. that song because uh you know I think when these on camera songs happen obviously they're supposed to be totally natural and seem just like this is a concert you know this is this is happening but the amount of you know that's song was written from scratch before the film was shot. It was, uh, you know, worked on, you know, I worked on it. Tara did incredible work on it. Ariana Grande, Kid Cudi. And then that we filmed it and they performed it. And so they had to do the whole performance. And then in post, we had to figure out how does it work into the movie? Where, how does it, how do you edit it in? And then in the end, it was even, I recorded strings, you know, a whole orchestra of strings at Air, Air, in, Air in London and that's mixed in, you know. So there's this whole long process that went in to that one special moment in the film. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tara. Uh, Hi. Tell us a little about how you became involved in the project. Had you worked with Adam before? I had not worked with Adam before. Um, so Nick and I have, were working on another project and um, he gave me a call about working on this. And of course, immediately, like who says no to, first of all, Nicholas Bertel and mm -hmm. then Ariana Grande and Kate Cuddy, um, who I'm big, big fan of both of them. So um, immediately I heard Ariana's uh, vocal and it was just this <laughs> angelic, beautiful melody and um, like not a not a bad note, like just beautiful, and um, and I could hear words through it. It's kind of like a thing that I that I do. Like I hear these phonetic phonetic so sounds, and then I just I can like pick the words out of them and make it make sense. And so um, the moment he sent me the melody, I started to hear the words and start to shape the story. And uh, like hearing her say like no 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 no, I'm like oh, it sounds like she's saying no bounds. And it just kind of worked out that way. <laughs> and um, so it, it was just Nick giving me a call and me saying yes, of course. Um, and uh, just because of the gravity of it as, a, as a, a world, everything that we were going through at the same time, it was the song pretty much wrote itself, watching the news and going through the different uh, highs and lows that we had in uh, the, the last couple of years, it, was, it definitely helped to uh, sculpt the song. And for everyone that hasn't seen it yet, um, can you tell us a little about, about how the song fits into the narrative of the movie? And I just want to say, I love when original songs are actually part of the movie as opposed to just in the end credits. And this has such a memorable uh, moment with Ariana singing it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's pretty much, a, it starts off as a, as a love song between these two characters that, that are in love and they are these, the celebrity couple and they're singing at, you know, I, without giving everything away. Um, but I will say that it's a love song that has to go from inward to out to the world to say like, okay, this is like starting off as a love song that it goes into this, what the hell are we doing? to ourselves, we're just, just look up because the world is about to end potentially, mm -hmm. you know? So um, that's pretty much the gist of the song. And so going from point A to point Z, <laughs> it's pretty much <laughs> what it was. Um, so it went from, you know, one uh, dramatic, went fr from a very natural start to a dramatic end. Um, and uh, it was pretty much, there's not really a, a something that you can kind of reference. <laughs> It was something that we were creating as it was being, you know, created. It was, it was sort of like, okay, well, does this work? And, and, and this is me talking to myself. Okay, I wonder if, if this is going to resonate with Nick or with Adam. And so by the time they got the lyrics, and this is me like grappling with myself uh, through the night and watching the news and picking ideas from there and just different, my own experience with COVID and, and just kind of like weighing it against um, 
the other catastrophic event, what could, which could be something, which is a huge fear of mine, like this, you know, like having this um, meteor. So um, it was, it wasn't hard to, to it was hard, very easy to imagine. And, and so I, I think that's why it was easy to write, you know, not easy, but it was, it was, it, it was, it was, yeah, it, it just, I was, the, the subject matter resonated with me so deeply because of m what was happening in, in the war, in our world. I Are we going to say, Nick? Full credit, I was just going to say full credit to you for <laughs> figuring out how this song could work because the initial, you know, the idea was exactly that. It's like it has to turn from a love song into mm -hmm. a song about we're all, maybe we're all going to die and what yeah, are we going to do? That's it. And, and, and that sounds, you know, it's like, that's really hard to pull off in a song without like breaking the song apart. Hey, and, yeah. um, you know, and, and Tara did that. So, you know, I wrote the initial, uh, the, I wrote sort of the chords and the, the idea of it. And then I went to, you know, Ariana and, and she immediately within like 30 seconds of hearing it laid down this incredible top line uh, it, right there in the studio. It was unbelievable. But at that point, Tara got involved and essentially figured out how storytelling wise, the lyrics could do that. And so that was a real kind of eureka moment for us. And mm -hmm. I think uh, that that made the song really possible in a sense to work, you know? Absolutely. Um, and at that point, then we brought, then Kid Cudi um, came in to, to look at his section of the song uh, as DJ Cello, because he's an actor obviously in the film too. And, um, and that was when he, uh, you know, he, Wrote, you know, sang his melody there and, and, and he wrote, he wanted to sort of, you know, channel his character, but also I think his own artistry into that moment too. So, so it was a really beautiful collaboration, but I just wanted to, you know, throw the credit over to you, Tara, because I mean, figuring out the music is one thing, but I feel the lyrics were a real challenge on this one. I um, love the lyric where Ariana, Ari, um, tells people Ari. to, um, take their head out of their ass and listen to the qualified scientists. That got a huge <laughs> laugh. I saw this with a big crowd on Thursday night. That, that got a, the biggest laugh of the whole movie. And I think, <laughs> I think Adam McKay actually said that the song moment is his favorite moment of the whole movie. Like, how does that make okay. you guys? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Enormous. I'm honored. I mean, it yeah. was a, it was a big uh, it was a big challenge. You know, I mean, I, I love these sorts of challenges, but but it was, um, you know, we were doing this, it was the, you know, during the pandemic, everything, this was before the film had been shot. So we were really kind of like imagining these things for ourselves and, um, and then, you know, credit to the whole filmmaking production for, for filming this beautiful concert. And, and also obviously to Ariana and Cuddy for performing it and making it real. Yeah. But they really, they really brought it, they really brought it home. And you, uh, Nicholas, you mentioned the, the intro with all the brass, um, music uh, instruments. Um, I think one of my favorite scores in this is the the dinner scene near the end, obviously not going to give anything away, but it's such an emotional, yeah. tender moment. Can you talk a little bit a bit about that um, score? Yeah, it's awesome you brought that up because to bring it all the way back, that piece of music is the overture to logic and knowledge. Mm. Mm. That oh, no. is the moment where after you've seen all these things, you hear the first thing I wrote actually for the film, which is that feeling of this sort of it's supposed to hopefully evoke a feeling of kind of awe at the universe and reverence for this moment, you know, and uh, and that's what that is. So that's that's the only place actually in the movie where you hear that exact version of it. You hear that motif woven in a lot of places throughout the film, but that's the moment where that happens. So that's that's cool. You uh, you pointed mm -hmm. that out. Um, Meryl Streep is is one of the best actresses working today, what was it like to actually score her? And did her character, the president, did she have any specific um, sound cues that we should pay attention to? It's interesting, you know, um, for me, when I'm working on scores, I often, I, I'm inspired by characters, but I, I don't often um, write themes for characters themselves. Oftentimes I, I like writing the concepts that are about relationships between things you know it's like i always feel like like there might be music around the relationship between two characters or about how those characters inter interrelate with the story and and in some ways i think different films have different um different types of architecture with that you know some films it is more about a character with another character on this film the themes in a way are about the characters but they're sort of about how those characters are about the whole superstructure of this world and what's going on, you know? So I would say there's a, with 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 Meryl, um, I think her 
oftentimes she, because of not giving any way, but because of certain relationships in the film, the, the bash communications music is sometimes around her. And also there's some very grand, uh, you know, uh, launch music and things like that, that happen around, uh, around Meryl's character. Um, but it's, but, you know, it's very much about the, you know, this movie is about very large scale forces. So I think a lot of the themes are about these very large scale kind of forces. Uh, final question. We are obviously an awards website at Gold Derby. We love talking about awards. You've both been nominated at the Oscars before and Nicholas, you won an Emmy for Succession. What would it mean to get nominated for this project at the Oscars? What would that just do for you? Uh, what would that mean uh, emotionally? It, it just means I get to work with Nicholas Bertel a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> That'll happen anyway. <laughs> We're gonna keep working. I, it, with, with or without, I know, I know. We're good. <laughs> but no, um, it, it means so much for me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. I'm like, um, in between. I, I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. I was raised in East Oakland, California. So I have a little bit of deep down south Southern girl, but then I have East radical East Oakland. So I'm, um, I, I'm all about empowering, um, like the the women, the youth from where I'm from, and just for I, I have a book called 100 Things Every Black Girl Should Know. So I love to be able to to just reach back and pull up and so that's the ultimate reach back pull up so if i can be able to show um girls in my neighborhood and women around the world that they can you know go from writing songs in their little compositional books like me to being nominated for an, and winning an oscar nicholas you know ever since i was a kid i loved film music it was uh it was the some of the first music actually that really got me to play the piano it was watching i saw chariots of fire and that vangelis theme uh inspired me to go figure out how to play the piano and i asked for piano lessons and you know so from when i was five years old i film music has meant so much to me and and growing up loving movies you know really loving movies and um i think the the oscars do really represent such a profound level of sort of resonance and uh and an achievement in an artistic category. And yes. I think for me, you know, it's uh, it's very moving. It's moving, honestly, just to be a part of this conversation. It's moving to be, uh, to be able to work on projects like this. Obviously winning is its own surreal kind of thing that, that uh, you never know really about. But, um, but I just think, I feel so lucky to be able to be here with you all and to be working yeah, with Tara same. and be working with Adam and, and, and all of these amazing collaborators. It's a very, it's a very special thing. Yes. Thank you guys for chatting with us. Everyone go out and watch the movie. It's opening in December in theaters and on Netflix as well. Uh, thanks, guys. Thank Great you. talking to you.